here we go. All right, so slip bobber fishing for walleye. Uh, first thing you're going to talk, we're going to talk about is why are you going to slip bobber fish over so many other tactics? The cool thing about walleye fishing is that there's a million different ways to catch them. You can long line troll for them, you can use inline boards, you can whip for them, you can jig for them. There's a million different things that you can do for fishing walleye. Um, the benefits of slip bobber fishing over other tactics. Precision fishing. For one, a lot of times these walleye, especially this time of year and especially in inland lakes, they will start to bury themselves into the weeds. The reason why they do this as summer goes on, as more pleasure boaters start coming out, as you get more jet skiers, water skiers, all of that, those fish start feeling kind of that pressure, they get a little bit skittish, they start burying themselves in the weed, they start going into deeper water. When you're using slip bobbers, you can put a bait directly in front of a fish. This whole tactic is not to cover water, it is not to search for fish, you are fishing a specific spot where you believe that there's going to be fish going to. Another key uh, uh, component to it is negative to, or neutral to negative fish. Fish are not always active. While they're not always active, they don't always want to eat. It's a lot of times you have to try and trigger a bite. You have to get that reaction strike. When the, the season starts to go on with these fish, they get very selective in what they want to eat. They go through, they do their spawn. After the spawn, they recover a little bit. They go into a big feed mode, and then as summer goes on, they get very selective in what they want to eat. So these neutral negative fish that are only eating in very narrow windows of time throughout the day, you can get them to bite by putting a very lively bait right in front of their nose. They're sniffing it, they're seeing it, they're smelling it. That triggers them to bite. The other thing is less hassle, quick catching, quick sorting of fish. You start getting into Houghton Lake, you start getting into some of these up north lakes, the majority of fish are attracted to an area for a certain reason. Walleye are not always the ones that are the only ones that are there. So there's a lot of times that you'll get into an area where if you're trolling, you're spending a lot of time setting lines out, you're spending a lot of time setting boards out, and you gotta consider something, when you get into smaller bodies of water, you're not always open water trolling. You're not covering ground, this isn't Saginaw Bay, this isn't Lake Erie where you just continue to troll until you get back into more fish. A lot of the fish will be in a specific place and you want to get that, you want to get right on top of that place. The most important thing probably with slip bobber fishing is a, the, the spot. This is not an effective method to do, to cover ground, you don't want to fish over flats, you don't want to search for fish. You need some sort of a target, some sort of structure, something that the fish are going to relate to, something that's going to hold the fish, something that they want which gets into rock humps. Rock humps, there's some rocky lakes up north, Lake St. Clair, not a ton of, lot, a ton, a ton of rocks. There's a good amount of, um, of weeds, um, but rock humps in a lot of the northern lakes are phenomenal places for slip bobber fishing. Another thing is points. Points are good no matter where they are, no matter how you're fishing, no matter what body of water they are. Um, a point will hold a lot of fish, especially if it's point that's going out into deeper water. Uh, this says reed lines, that was a typo on my air. Uh, it should read weed lines. Uh, Lake St. Clair, there's a lot of very good weed lines. There's a lot of very big patches of weeds. And there's little holes inside those patches of weeds or those big weed flats. And those fish will sit inside of those. Another um, uh, structure to look for is sharp breaks. Um, Tight contours, you get onto the edge in Lake St. Clair, you get onto the edge of some of these channels, there's a lot of tight, uh, sharp breaks. Uh, fish relate to those. As summer goes on, as the water starts to heat up, they push down into some deeper water. They'll sit in those deeper water and they sit at the bottom of those sharp breaks because it is the quickest avenue for them to get up into the shallow flats where a lot of the fish, or a lot of the bait fish are, and they do a lot of their feeding at that time. Probably one of the best things that you can find is a combination of gravel or rock near weeds. There will be lakes, and, and it can, can get a little bit of intimidating when you're looking at a map or when you're looking through your GPS unit and you're saying, well, this lake is full of weeds. 
this lake is full of rocks. Well, where can you look to kind of take some of, you know, if 90% if of the lake is filled with weeds, where are you going to go or where are you going to look that's something a little bit different? Well, if you can find a spot where maybe a point is coming out, a rock point is coming out, and it's meeting a weed line, now you're eliminating a lot of the lake, you're dividing it in half and saying, okay, well, I'm going to try and focus on the areas that are specifically like, like this because they're unlike anywhere else on the lake. Another very, very uh, great structure is sunken islands. This is probably one of my favorite things next to weed lines to fish slip bobber fishing. Um, we don't have any of them out on Lake St. Clair. You get into Holton Lake, uh, there's the Middle Grounds, which is phenomenal fishing. There's an area called Little Round. There's sunken islands that are in Traverse City, Traverse Bay. Those are very good spots. Um, this is a little il illustration that I kind, of, uh, I kind of took to kind of discuss a little bit of the different types of areas. So when you're looking at A right here, basically you have a couple patches of weeds where there is a creek, a river, a stream, some sort of a water outlet. When you see this, when you see current, exactly. When you look at something like this, think of it as a vein feeding this lake. Anywhere that you can find any sort of an inlet that is letting water in, it's typically attracting bait fish and that obviously will attract bigger fish, predator fish. So target A or right, or right here is a very good example of, uh, you know, in Holton Lake, there's uh, the Cut River. Cut River is a really great spot right out in front of there. If you can find the adjacent weeds to it, it is a very good spot to target. B is something that I'm not very, you know, crazy on. We'll, we'll kind of loop B and F together. These would be more like back basins, um, back little coves and lakes. Uh, if you look at B, you have kind of a shallow flat that kind of extends in here uh, into probably the heaviest weed cover in this whole entire lake. And typically those back basins, that's how they're going to be. They're going to be very shallow, very warm, very weedy. But as the season goes, everybody associates fish with going to deeper water because it's colder, there's more oxygen. However, weeds give off a lot of oxygen. So as these fish start to transition out into deeper water, some of them stay, but some of them come back in the heat of the summer because the amount of oxygen that is given off in those weeds is almost the same as what it's going to be in that deeper, colder water. These would be really good spots on a lake. Um, it's probably less traffic. You know, you're going to have people zipping around doing the water skiing and everything in the main part of the lake. So if you want to get away from the boat traffic, you want to kind of, uh, uh, you know, do your own thing, not as pressured, those are really good areas to, uh, to look at. Looking at C, this is going towards those weed lines. Now this is probably one of my favorite things on this illustration. When I'm looking at maps before I go to a lake and before I fish a lake, one of the things that I'm looking for is sharp break lines with, with uh, weed lines that are running parallel to them. They're running the same way as these. Now, most every lake is going to have this. This is probably going to be the most common structure that you're going to find in most lakes. The nice thing about this is that this is all adjacent to the main part of the lake and probably the deepest part of the lake. So a lot of these fish will come out, they'll be sitting out in the middle part of the lake, and the bait fish will be up inside these weeds, and they'll kind of stage around in here throughout the day, and they'll slowly push themselves up onto these weed edges as you know the evening goes on or as their feeding time starts to pick up. So this would be probably one of my favorite places uh, uh, to kind of key in and look at, look for when you're when you're diagnosing a lake and when you're getting ready to slip out or fish. D would be a um, another very great. That's probably my second favorite thing is uh, points. Uh, this one has a little bit of it showing two humps next to it, but we'll just look at like this point and we'll actually loop uh, D and E together because they're both they're both points. D is a very sharp point that is a very shallow point that is going out into very deep water. It's the same kind of uh, uh, scenario as in C where a lot of the fish will be sitting off in the deeper part of the water as the evening goes on, as those fish start moving up into shallow water to eat. Um, this is a very good spot to target. Points are always very, very good. They hold a lot of fish. Um, try and key in, you know, when, when you're up north and you're looking at a lot of these lakes or anybody of water that you're on, 
look for uh, uh, docks along shoreline. If you have a dock that is going way, way, way out, it kind of is telling you that there's a shallow flat that's coming off a of shore that's going way out, so they have to have a longer dock in order to reach that deeper water. So it kind of gives you an idea of how the shoreline looks underwater without actually seeing it. Same thing with like the floating rafts. People put floating rafts out in the summer and uh, enjoy it for swimming and sun tanning and all that. Typically, those will be out towards the edge of the flat towards the drop-off. So if you see a raft that's way, way out, it's kind of giving you an in indication of where that drop-off starts. Um, G would be the humps. Humps are a great, great, great thing to fish. Uh, Houghton Lake, middle round. Awesome, awesome place to fish. Uh, when you get into East and West Traverse Bay, there's a lot of humps. Guys do very, very well um, slip over fishing for fish on rock humps, weed humps. Um, my favorite kind of humps to find are ones that come up and kind of plateau out and flatten out on the top. So if you can find any of that, um, those are key areas. Now, in discussing all of this, you have to have some sort of a plan before you go out and slip over fish. You're not going to go out there and slip over fish and just say, well, hey, I'm going to put this uh, night crawler on, I'm going to flip it out there, I'm going to wait till the bobber goes down. You have to have a target area. So you have to do your homework before you slip bobber fish. You have to kind of look and say, these are some key areas. Uh, I use the Navionics app on my phone. It's a great app. I'll go through, I'll add pins on, on the lake that I'm going to. I'll look for those wheat, those, those points. I'll look for uh, steep breaks. I'll look for humps, and then I'll go through and I'll use my GPS unit and my graphing unit to go through and see if, is there any sort of weeds on these humps? Is there any sort of weeds that are coming off of these points? Is there a rock on these points? If you could go back one slide. Cabbage weed. Cabbage weed is a magnet for walleye. This is probably one of the best things that you can find. If you can find cabbage weed in a lake, the majority of the walleye are going to be attracted to that. So when you start getting into lakes where it seems very overwhelming, you say, well, you know, Eric talked about finding weeds and finding weed lines, and but this lake is just full of weed lines. It's full of points. It's full of, uh, of humps. Where should I go? What weed bed should I target? These are the weeds that you are after. If you can find cabbage weed, it is the best thing that you can find in a lake. Not only that, but green cabbage weed. The greenest, brightest, healthiest, best looking cabbage weed, I don't know what it is. I don't know if that it's very leafy. If those fish get inside there, they feel very comfortable. If it hides them, what but over milfoil or any other kind of weed, they are very, very attracted to that. Go to the next slide, rock. Everybody knows what rock looks like, but if you can get a combination of the two, where say rock is gradually coming down like this looks like a hump, or it looks like it's a point coming down and it's starting to go into deeper water. If out in this area or along the side of this, if you can find rock that meets that cabbage weed, you found the spot. That's a great, great area to look for. Uh, so this is an example. How many, how many people have uh, like summer family trips set up or you've got a cottage up north or you're going camping and you're going to a new body of water or somewhere that you haven't fished a whole lot? How many people have trips planned this summer? I'm sure everybody kind of has, has something, family trips going on. This is a picture of my unit last year. We went on a, uh, on a fun trip, a group of friends of mine, um, their wives, their kids. We went to Otsego Lake. So what I did on Otsego Lake is I trolled all over the place. I pitched jigs all over the place. I pitched ribbon wraps all over the place. I, pitched, I, I, I trolled uh, crawler harnesses, leech rigs, uh, crankbaits, you name it. Two days, no walleye. What I started to realize is that the fish were very skittish during the day. The fish were very selective in when they wanted to eat and there was about a window of an hour half an hour before sunset and a half an hour under or after sunset that those fish were getting really active. So what I recommend for you to do is when you're up on these family trips, all this mapping that I did, I did while everybody wanted to go for a boat ride. 
friend's kid wants to go for a boat ride, the wives, everybody, let's get on the boat. I am doing research while I'm taking everybody out on the boat and taking them for a nice ride. It's nice, it's sunny, I'm not catching fish during the day, so there's really no point in me investing a bunch of time. So it was kind of my trick, well, I'll take everybody for boat rides, I'll sneak out at the last couple hours of, of, of light, and I'll get out fishing. So you'll see, if you kind of watch my uh, my tracer, I was mark going back and forth, going back and forth, and what I started to realize is that in this area, it was the deepest hole of Otsego Lake. In this area was a giant flat, and it was five, four, five, six feet at that. What I started to do while I was doing all these boat rides is I started zigzagging back and forth, and I said, well, how far does this drop go, and how far does this weed line go? Every time that I crossed over this drop edge right here, and this is up on here, you can see it's about five, five foot, six foot, it dropped down into 14 feet. Every time I went over that ridge, what I ended up doing is dropping a pin. Throughout the day of giving boat rides and I was doing my research, I ended up mapping out this whole entire line. This is a, 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 the shallow weed line adjacent to the deepest water in the whole entire lake. So I knew, well, when everybody's out jet skiing, water skiing, these fish are kind of hunkered down in this deeper water. But up on top of here, where it's super weedy, they're really slipping up. They're going to, you know, they're going to start slipping up in there in the evening and start eating. Sure enough, they started to do that, and we started getting into some fish. This is showing, you know, you can see the boat direction. This is me going from deeper water back into it. And you can see how steep that is. And I don't know if that's a fish or if that's bait or what that is, but it's sitting right there. So we ended up going every, every evening. Um, we only had a few hours to fish, but it was the most effective thing that we could do in the short time that we had to fish. So what we ended up doing is setting up on the inside of this, on that shallow water, and kind of cut the fish off with our baits as they were coming up in this deeper water and slowly slipping up in here. Next picture is a pretty decent walleye I ended up getting. It's a 23, 24 inch walleye I ended up getting out on Seago. We ended up doing fairly well. We got a lot of smaller fish, um, but this is one of the one of the better fish that we ended up getting on that trip. So, uh, pretty dandy fish considering I threw the whole kitchen sink at them for two days, couldn't get a fish to go, and then, you know, we switched to slip bobber fishing and really started getting into fish. So when we're talking about equipment for slip bobber fishing. Now, I know a lot of you guys had raised your hand and said that you have fished for, uh, for panfish before using slip bobbers. It's a sort of a basic slip bobber rig. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail when I get these rods in my hand and kind of show you the way that I like to, to set it up. Basically, you have your bobber stop. I like to use the knot style bobber stops. They're easy to slide up and down. Uh, they're easy to cast out of the guides. They're fairly smooth. They're nice. They're convenient for me. I would run a bead as a stopper so that this doesn't, your float obviously doesn't slide over your stopper. I run another uh, another bead just below it. That way, if I'm not using any sort of weight in here, it is not bashing against the knot that is on my swivel. Now, this is a very important part. A lot of people think that in order to get your rig down to the bottom, you want to increase your jig size. That is not what you want to do. Your bait is going to do the work for you. If you put a big heavy, if you're fishing in 20 foot of water and you say, you know what, I need to use a half ounce jig in order for that jig to get down where I want it to. The problem is you basically are anchoring that piece of bait right next to that jig and it has nowhere to go. You need to think of it as a leash. So what I like to do is, is I use um, like a crimp on split shot and I put them above the swivel. Um, you're going to use those as many as you need in order to get your bait down to the depth that you want. You do not want to increase the, uh, the weight of your jig or your bare hook. Uh, so talking about rod and reel, I'm going to have to set down the mic for a second. I'll try and talk loud. Now, I'm not going to tell anybody to go out and buy all heavies or heavy duty long slip bobber rods. This is a cheaper rod that I used to use for jigging a long time ago. This is just a Berkley Lightning rod. It's a cheap reel. It's about a $50 setup. This is one that I keep on the boat if I have extra people, extra friends. 
whatever. It has its ups, it has its definitely has its downs and its disadvantages. And I'll talk about some of the advantages of these longer rods, and then that way you can kind of understand the difference. This is an eight foot six Shimano convergence rod. This is actually a steelhead rod. Um, I like using these rods probably the most. I have two of these that I use uh, most of the time. It is a very good rod because it has a lot of it has a lot of sensitivity to it. But the importance of having a long rod and having this type of action on it is when you're using a shorter rod like that, if you have a crawler, a leech, whatever, you have to really throw that bait in order to get it out there. And a lot of times what you'll do is you'll kill your live bait, you'll throw your live bait off. Using a nice longer rod like this allows me to kind of flip out the bait at a lot longer distance. The rod does a lot of the work, gets the bait further away to the target of where I'm uh, trying to throw the bait, gets it a lot further away from the boat. Um, I also like, this is a St. Croix. This rod is uh, specifically designed for, uh, it's a seven foot six, it's a medium light. This rod is actually specifically designed for this type of fishing. It's a, a, a slip, and, slip and float rod. Uh, if you look, it's the tip that has the action. Now the importance of the tip having the action is when you start talking about line. I use an eight pound main line. Stren is great line, it's very abrasion resistant. Uh, that Stren on that line, you want to use monofilament. The reason why you want to use monofilament it floats, so when your float is sitting out there, your line is floating on top of the water, it's not sinking. So when you have to, when your float goes down and you have to pick up line really, really quick, you're not reeling line that's already sinking underwater, it's laying on the top. The also, the, the benefit of it is the stretch. This is not meat hauling fishing, this is not, uh, you know, trolling where you're cranking in the fish and yes, you're fighting them a little bit, you're going to get a fish that's going to want to pull drag, you need to have an, uh, a decent reel, a decent drag, and you need to have a rod that's got some play in it so that you can use that 8-pound test and not lose those bigger fish. As far as a leader goes, I like to use a 12-pound uh, a fluorocarbon leader. Now, most times you would use a lighter leader than what your main line would be. If I was pitching jigs and I was in a very snaggy area, I would want to use a lighter line so that way if I snag into rocks, if I snag into brush, whatever, I'm breaking my line off, my jig, whatever it is, I still have my swivel, I still have my main line, I'm not losing a bunch of line, and uh, I can go ahead and just retie this. The reason why you don't really want to do that with slip bobber fishing, there's a few reasons. Uh, one of it is that heavier line, these fish are, are going to eat the bait. They're going to see it, they're going to smell it. They're not going to swat at it. They're not going to, you know, grab it. In most cases, they have it down in their throat. So you want some sort of a line that can uh, withstand the teeth, the abrasion, and not break off. So it's just a little extra safety. Um, that's why I like to use a little bit heavier, um, heavier line. Um, as far as the rigging goes, we kind of touched a little bit about the way that I like to set it up. Um, this one I like to use more for, uh, you know, pitching into uh, little holes, little pockets that are inside of uh, weeds. So it's a little bit shorter rod. It's easier for me when I'm on the front of the boat to kind of flip this out into a little pocket that I see and put it right in front of their face. So this one's just a set up with a, with a, a fill float. Um, I prefer these fill floats. I got a couple of them up here for you guys to check out. They are the Pro Series. The reason why I like these still floats is the hole in the top of it has a, a, a metal grommet on it. it. Seems to last a lot longer. They cost a little bit more money, not much. They're well worth the extra money. Um, but you can't really run a, or, or uh, cause a groove into the top of the slip bobber. I was starting to get an issue with a lot of my slip bobbers when a good fish was on it and that barber was down and I'd go to set the hook, all that tension in the line would start to cut into that plastic and it would start to cause abrasion on my main line and it would end up breaking my main line. 
So this way it's, it slides very smoothly. And the other thing, if you're fishing in deeper water, and uh, say you're fishing uh, 20 feet down over 25 feet of water, this slides extremely fast and extremely easy. So you can use a lighter jig and it'll flutter down to the bottom a lot faster because there's a lot less resistance on this float. Put a bead in here, like I said before, it just kind of uh, softens the blow so that your float's not bashing into either your knot or into your, uh, your split shot. Um, I use these crimp on style split shots so that I can take them on and off very quick. Um, sometimes you, it, it's kind of a balance thing, you're going to have to put a couple on, take a couple off, figure out what you need in order to get your bait down to where you want it. A nice swivel, it's always great to have a swivel for when you're fighting fish to avoid tangles, to let that fish kind of free, free fight. And this one's set up with a, uh, with a small jig. Um, I also like to use bear hooks a lot of times. Uh, bear hooks work really, really good. But like I mentioned before, you got to think of this whole rig. And your, as far as your spacing goes with your, with your shot, this is kind of like your leash length. So if you want that, if, the, if those fish are coming up and they're sniffing it, but they're not really biting it, and you kind of want that minnow or you want that leech to move a little bit more, if you slide this up, especially when you're using a bear hook, it's more or less a pivot point of where that thing can kind of move around. So it's going to circle around that wall, he's going to look at it, and it's going to tempt him into it. If you're in water that's uh, a little bit choppier, it's windier, uh, you don't want your bait to move a whole lot, you're going to add a couple more shot on here. It's going to kind of keep that float pinned down in a spot. If, uh, if, you know, if, if you notice there's an area where walleye are, are, are really holding tight, um, you add a couple extra shot, it'll keep it right, right in front of their nose. Um, we'll go into drift socks a little bit more when I start talking about the different ways of uh, sorry the different ways of uh, kind of anchoring yourself and executing all of this. Uh, this is just kind of a list of the basic equipment that you're going to want to have. You obviously, got to have a rod and reel. Got to have line on that rod and reel. Um, Drift socks are a very effective thing to have in the boat. Anchor, more, majority of the time you're going to be anchoring. A headlamp is very good to have because it's, it's usually a very good bite leading on into the evening. So it's good to keep in the boat, it's good to keep a lantern in the boat. Even if you don't plan on, on fishing late in the evening, you never know how the bite's going to be. You might be out there and be like, this is some of the best fishing I've ever had. You end up staying out a little bit longer than you want to. I personally like staying a little bit late, staying uh, more into the dark, so I always keep that on the boat. And then a marker buoy. So when I was going through and I was marking those areas and I kind of figured out, okay, and on Seagull Lake, this is where this, this weed line is and, and this is where uh, the deep water is going up. I keep a marker buoy. I like this Rapala marker buoy. It has a uh, built-in light in it and as soon as it hits the water, the LEDs light up. So you don't have to turn it on, you don't have to do anything like that. You literally drop it over the side of the boat. Um, you can also use, how many people have spools of line where they go to spool a reel and they get to the end of it and they got, on the left on the spool there's 30 yards worth of line. You say, well what am I going to do with this? I don't know, this is junk now, I can't put it on another reel. For the longest time what I did is I would use that 20, 30 feet of line, take a pop bottle, wrap it, wrap it around the neck of the pop bottle, put a, a, a two ounce sinker on it, egg sinker, you got a homemade buoy, they work really good. The benefit of having a buoy like this that is flat sided, the more you get into this, the more you get interested in it, this is a good investment. The reason why a flat sided buoy is really good, if I'm going along and I say, okay, this is the spot, and I drop it over the side of the boat, this will only flip until it hits the bottom, and then it kind of sits there. Unless the wind is really blowing, it kind of sits on the spot. The problem you'll have with a round buoy, or if you're using that pop bottle, if you know the basic, uh, the, the depth of the area that you want to fish, say it's 15 feet, kind of guess 15, 20 feet, tie a knot around the neck of the bottle, tie a knot around your floating buoy so it doesn't continue to add line out. Problem I've had with the round buoys is you drop it down, there's a little bit of a breeze, it keeps rolling on top of the water because it's round, and now I might have dropped it into 10 feet of water, but the wind has blown out 50 feet of this line, so now my marker buoy is way over here when this is the area that I want to be fishing. 
in that case, why would you not just mark it on your graph? It's good to have a visual target because when you're going through and you're setting your lines out, once you when we get to the next point of kind of setting up and where you're anchoring, it's good to have that visual. So you're not just looking at your graph and saying, well, I think I'm right about there. I think it's about 30 feet over there. It just gives you a visual target. You know that that's sitting right where you want your baits. And it helps you, but it also helps the other people in the boat. When we were up in Otsego, I had a couple friends that they like to fish. They don't get to fish as often. Cast it towards the buoy. If you get it close to the buoy, you're in the zone. Save a waypoint too. A so absolutely. You can find the buoy. A yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and they get they're they're they you know they've got some pretty interesting buoys out now. They actually have ones that look like a seagull. That's how you know crazy some fishermen. I I don't get that crazy, but some people don't want anybody knowing that they have a marker buoy out. Uh, they see somebody goes driving by, they see a marker buoy, and say, "Oh, that's the spot. I'm going to go there. I'm going to set up and fish on that." So they actually make ones that look like seagulls, which I think is a little overboard. But you could throw one of those out and kind of disguise it. So talking about live bait. Now this is live bait fishing. This is not um, this is not trolling crawler harnesses. This is not jigging the Detroit River. Live bait is very very important. The live bait is going to do the work for you. You're not imparting an action onto the bait. Um, it is very important to take very good care of your bait. You're fishing the Detroit River. You take a big old shiner. You thread it up that hook. You're pounding it on the bottom. It's there for scent, it's there for flash, it's not there to wiggle, your, it's not there to put action on it. You're out trolling crawler harnesses on Lake St. Clair, you uh, put a crawler on there, you want a, a, you know, a decent healthy crawler so it stays on there. The, blade, the turbulence of the blade is doing a lot of the action on that crawler. But when you're doing this style of fishing, live bait is extremely important. You want your bait to do the work for you, you want the livest and best bait that you can get. So crawlers, night crawlers are a very, very good thing for slip bobber fishing. This is a crawler caddy. This keeps uh, keeps fish, or I'm sorry, keeps the crawlers uh, cold, keeps them very lively, keeps them really firm. Um, you obviously don't have to go out and rush out and buy one of these, but they are very nice to have. It's got a compartment on the inside of it. You go to the dollar store, you get a couple uh, ice packs, put it in there, put a little, um, bedding in there, worm bedding in there, keeps your worms very, very lively, very fresh. You don't want to have a crawler that's very soft, very mushy, that's down there and every little goby, every little perch, every little anything that touches that crawler is ripping it off. So this is a very, very nice uh, container. Minnow bucket. I'm sure everybody's got a minnow bucket. This is very important with your minnows when you are doing this type of fishing. The reason being is you want something that's going to be really lively and you want them to be acclimated with the water temperature of what they're going to be going into. You do not want to take it and shock it and throw it out there and all of a sudden that minnow is in, in a panic, doesn't know what to do, it's not really moving much. I'm fortunate enough, my boat has two built-in bait wells. It pumps in lake water, it gets those bait fish acclimated with the water temperature. I go in there, I go to grab a minnow out of there, they're very lively, they're ready to go. If you don't have that, I would get one of these bait tanks. Don't just set it in the bottom of the boat where the sun is beating on the bucket and it's getting the, you know, the water temperature is really hot and say it's 10 degrees cooler once you take that minnow and you throw it out into the lake, that minnow all of a sudden, you know, goes into a little bit of shock and isn't very lively. The other thing, when you're talking leech fishing, this is a leech tamer. Same kind of premise as with the minnows. It's nice to keep your leeches inside of this and throw it in the live well so that they are acclimated with the water temperature. The issue is with leeches, they will ball up. So if you were to take a leech out of a container, put it on your hook, throw it over the side of the boat, it's not used to that water temperature, it's gonna ball up in a little curly cue. It's really not gonna do you much. It's not gonna swim around, you're not gonna get the action from it. It's not going to work for you. This is about a $15 item. Um, it's really nice to have. I like to have it for, to keep my leeches in. So something to consider. The last thing is where laws permit is bait traps. Bait traps are very, very good. Nothing is better than having the local forage. Houghton Lake, 
they have blue shiners. Blue shiners, the fish love them there. You can't buy blue shiners anywhere. You can go and put a bait trap out, tie it to, the, tie it to your boat, tie it to the dock, put some crackers in it, come out the next day, you have forage from that lake. So you have very, very good live bait that way. So if you have a bait trap lying around, bring that with you on your, on your, uh, on your trip. So one of the most important things with slip bobber fishing is boat position. You want to intercept those fish in their transition. So when we were talking about earlier, we were showing the map of the lake, likely areas of where fish are going to be at during the daytime and where they're going to slowly transition to when they start getting active and start feeding, you want to intercept them. The best way of doing that, and this sounds a little kind of weird, you got to think about it for a second, you want to position the boat upwind and sideways. So what I mean by that is if you're fishing on, say, a, a, an open water hump and the, um, and the wind is going from west to east, you would want to be on the west side of that hump or on top of that hump and you want to position your boat sideways. The reason why it helps having two anchors and putting your boat sideways is you have the whole entire side of the boat to run lines off of. So if it's not just me, if I have another person, we're running six slip bobbers, I can throw one out that way, this way, this way, this way, this way. If I had the nose of the boat into the wind and one anchor, that boat's going to want to swing back and forth. Well, what do you think it's going to do every time it's swinging? I have a couple slip bobbers out there. They're sitting in a rod holder. I'm waiting for them to go down. Well, now that boat's swinging and it's starting to pull those bobbers around. And it's not necessarily always a bad thing to have that little bit of movement in it due to the wind. But for the most part, you're trying to keep that bait in a specific spot. You want those fish to come up, look at it, sniff it. They're not active. They're not looking to eat. But it's very hard for them to resist when there is a leech when there's a night crawler dangling right in front of their face. Anchors. I talked about having two anchors. I like the mushroom style anchors. Uh, they fit in my storage really easy. I keep two anchors on my boat at all time. I keep one in the front of the boat. I keep one in the back of the boat. Now when we're trying to set up, when you're trying to do your boat position sideways, a lot of guys have a really hard time. They say, well, I threw one anchor out, by the time I got it set, the whole boat swung around, so now the front of my boat is facing, or the back of my boat is facing where I don't want it to. So what I like to do is, off the back corner of my boat, I will drop the first anchor, I will get it set, I will use my bow-mounted trolling motor to kind of push myself up so I'm parallel to the area that I want to fish, exaggerate it, go a little bit past, throw my anchor, and actually trolling motor back so that it's kind of setting myself up, it's digging in, and it's keeping me nice and parallel and sideways to the target. Uh, another effective, very effective way is spot lock. A lot of the troll motors these days have spot lock. When I was fishing uh, at Seagull, I used spot lock the whole entire time. Never threw an anchor out, never used a drift sock, I used spot lock. The reason being is that I couldn't find a good concentration where it was, I'm going to anchor here and the fish are going to be there. They were scattered throughout that whole entire line. I would go on a spot, I would sit up on the weeds, I would cast out into the deeper water, intercept those fish. When the bite started to slow down, I'd move another 20, 30 feet down the line, hit spot lock again, more or less is anchoring you, and then you can cast out and, and, and target more fish. Same way as you would if you use spot lock when you're perch fishing. Um, you don't have to worry about pulling the anchor all up, and if you want to do a subtle change, it's very easy to move. Drift socks. Now, there's a very effective method, and it's drifting uh, slip bobbers. It's getting into a little bit of, uh, I guess, the trolling type. It's kind of a mix between the two in a way. Um, if you have very, very light wind, you don't need anything. But what a lot of guys will like to do, and what I, I will do um, early part of the year on uh, Holt Lake especially, those cabbage weeds are just starting up in some of the deeper water. I go around, I look for areas where there's about a foot of cabbage weed off of the bottom. I'll mark those spots and I'll go through and I'll kind of drift over them. When you do that, if there's any sort of a breeze or you need to slow yourself down, I have an assortment of drift socks. I got these from Amazon, I think they were like 20 bucks a piece. I got um, three or two of three different sizes. 
I like to throw one off the front, off the back, it keeps you sideways. So just like we talked about before, with positioning your boat sideways and running all your lines out the side of the boat, it's the same kind of a deal. And the other thing that'll help too, when you're positioned sideways like that and you have the wind, you, you want the wind at your back so that it's pushing the bobbers away from you, if anything. You don't want them blowing into the boat and then all of a sudden you're constantly reeling them up and flipping them back out there. If anything else, they'll get to kind of the end of the line and they'll just sit there and they won't go any further. But it keeps them out further away from the boat. So uh, uh, a good way that you can do that to cover a little bit more water while you're slip bobber fishing is to float over those areas. Don't anchor, don't spot lock, slowly drift over them, pitch your, um, pitch your slip float rigs out and uh, cover a little bit of water until you can kind of dial in the area of where that you know that those fish really are at and then maybe go through and try and anchor on them. Patience. You're going to have to have patience. Like we said before, I said before, these fish will eat in a very narrow window. They get very selective. It might be a half an hour window and a 24 hour day that they decide to eat. It can get very frustrating for a lot of people to go out to a spot that they believe is going to hold a lot of fish. They think, oh, I'm going to knock them dead. I got everything all good to go. I got my bobbers out there. Nothing's happening. And they wait a half an hour. They wait an hour. There's no fish here. I'm moving. I'm going on to the next spot. Have confidence in the place that you're fishing. Those fish will show up. If they don't show up, then that spot that you thought was going to be a good area maybe wasn't that great of an area. Try another one the next day. Have patience. There's too many times where we're all fishing, you have six, nine, 12 lines out in the water, you're trolling, you got a million things going on, you're watching your graph, you're um, you know, paying attention to boat traffic, you're trying to keep on your line when you're trolling, you're jigging in the river, there's freighters coming, you got a million things going on. It's relaxing, easy fishing. You're sitting in an area, you're in the boat, light a cigar, Kick back, enjoy the scenery, enjoy the sunset, wait for the fish to come to the spot, intercept them, and um, uh, just have the patience. Uh, two other things that I want to talk about, a lot, of, a lot of mistakes that I see people and friends that I have in the boat with me make, setting the hook when you're slip bobber fishing. Most people will see a bobber go down and they automatically want to just set the hook. Well, bobber's down, set the hook. It's extremely important when you're doing this to reel up to when you feel the fish. You don't want to try and set the hook and pull the slack out of the line. Just because that bobber's down, you don't know how much line that you have kind of floating around on the surface and you're not setting the hook, you're not getting a good hook set. By the time you get to the back of your hook set, you took up three quarters of it with slack line and the only part of the hook set you're getting is at the very, very end. What I like to do is keep the rod tip down, I reel up until I feel tension or I feel the fish. They're not going anywhere. If your bobber's down, they've got the bait, they got what they want, it's usually down in their throat, they're happy, they got what they want, they're eating. Be patient. Reel up till you feel it, and it's just as simple as a, 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 a firm lift. You want to drive that hook in. I like to use a VMC hook or a Gamagatsu hook, a nice sharp hook. I always keep a hook file with me. Um, it's very important to keep a, hard, a sharp hook. You have very limited tackle on what you're using when you do this, so you want to make sure that each one of the components is performing the best as possible. So a good sharp hook, reel up until you feel the fish, lift up and you'll drive that hook into their mouth. You want to make sure that you're keeping um, what I try and set my drag at so that if I'm all the way at the back of my hook set, it'll slip one time. You'll hear it click one time. Reason being is sometimes when you're on a really good fish, even though these rods have a lot of play in them, even though your monofilament has a lot of stretch and a lot of play in it, I've had times where I've set the hook on a big fish and ended up breaking the line. So it's nice at the very back end of your hook set to kind of have uh, allow this this reel to slip a little bit. Um, any questions? Is the hole problem? Yes. Um, I like to hook them through the collar. 
hook the crawler through the collar. They seem to live a lot longer. Um, I guess that brings me to, to another point as well, how you want to hook your bait. Uh, leeches, I like to hook through the sucker. It's a very, very uh, tough part of that leech. It stays on really, really well. Uh, you can also hook the leech halfway down its body on the side and it'll swim and flutter. As far as minnows go, I've heard a lot of guys say that they like to, to hook it right behind the uh, dorsal fin and further towards the back tail and the reason being is it kind of puts that minnow on an angle like this and that minnow is going to constantly fight to get horizontal again. Um, I found the same to be true by hooking it through the lips, uh, especially if you're using a jig. That jig is going to kind of pin that, um, pin that minnow down, pin its nose down, and just the same way they're fighting up to get, uh, to get you know, back to horizontal. Um, so I like hooking them through the head. Not only that, when you're casting it out, retrieving it in to check your bait, they seem to stay on a lot better when you're hooked through the lip. You don't have that resistance of pulling that minnow sideways. Um, check your baits every 15 minutes. No matter what's happening, every 15 minutes you want lively bait. If you got a crawler that's on there, it's half bitten off, now's the time. Grab, take it off, put a new crawler on. You got a leech that's all chewed up that doesn't seem to be moving very well. You got a minnow that doesn't seem to be moving very well. Take it off, flip it out there. The live bait is very important. That's what's going to get you your strikes. That's what's triggering all the bites is that action of that live bait right in front of those fish. Any other questions? Eric, one spot that I know you didn't touch on because we don't have a lot of it in Michigan, but flooded timber. Down trees is just dead. Yep. Um, flooded timber is really good. Uh, a lot of guys out west where there is a lot more flooded timber, they slip bobber in it. And the reason being is that they can't fish it any other way. They can't troll through it. They have a hard time pitching jigs through it. So what you can do is you can set this, uh, set your presentation above that timber and try and get those fish to come out of it. One thing that I'm going to definitely tinker with this summer, now that those fish are getting offshore and they're starting to go into the deeper water, there's wrecks in Lake St. Clair. If you go onto some of these uh, uh, Coast Guard websites, you can get the coordinates for them. I am going to slip bobber over the top of wrecks. I know a couple guys that I work with that dive quite a bit, a port, and a they tell me that no. some of those wrecks out there are just littered with gobies and littered with walleyes. So um, getting to the brush, the timber, it's, uh, you know, I don't know the severity of some of these wrecks, how much they come up off the bottom, how much wood there is to them, but uh, I always keep a bottom uh, finder clipped to me whenever I'm doing this, because you're constantly going to be changing how far down you want your bait. Um, kind of a rule of thumb, uh, you, you, you obviously want to be closer to the bottom, but you want to be above the fish. You want them to come up and see it. You want them to look at it. Uh, most fish look up, especially walleye, they look up to feed. They don't typically want to go down. So it's better to be a little bit higher than to be below them. So I'm constantly using my bottom tester. Um, I'll drop it down. You see your float go down. However, your bottom's out. However far your float is from the surface of the water, that's how far your bait's going to be suspended off the bottom. I've caught fish in... 30 foot of water, 20 feet down. I've caught fish in five feet of water and literally had the float almost touching my swivel. So you're talking a 20 inch liter. Um, so it varies, you gotta tinker with it. If you can find fish on your GPS unit or on your sonar unit, if you're going over these different areas and these different uh, hubs or transitions and you see that there's fish suspending at a certain height, set it a foot or two right above that height. Kind of judge it. Ah, they look like they're 10 feet down. Okay, well, this looks like uh, this looks like 10 feet to me. I'm going to slip my stop up and start fishing that area. That's the most effective way. Now, when I'm, I typically will set out two of these, and I'll use my other rod to kind of constantly pitch, but vary your, uh, your length and how high you have it. I'll put all my lines, say, there's, say I'm sitting up on top of a hump, and I've got a drop off right in front of me and I'm throwing my baits out into that deeper water. Well, I got one, two, three baits. They're all sitting in the same, about the same depth of water. 
but this one I might, if I'm in 15 foot of water, this one I might set up uh, really high. I might make that one 7 feet. This one I might make 10 feet down. That one I'm going to go 12 feet. Whatever one gets bit, you kind of know where those fish are sitting at and where they're starting to come up at, and I'll start to slowly adjust, uh, adjust my other lines to, to that height. Any uh, other questions? I like to use number twos and uh, number ones. I like a little bit of a bigger hook. Uh, a lot of guys will use a lot smaller hook. Uh, a number one and number two, I have some up here. They seem to be a pretty good size hook. Um, I don't change them for the bait. They both seem to be fairly, you know, can use it for, for either which one. Um, I got a couple little prize packs, uh, courtesy of Sportsman's Direct. So uh, I'd like to give these away. Question. What is the best type of weeds that you can find when you're slip fishing? Cabbage. Yeah. 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 You two are first. Now, how many, who's here for the first time today? Who's their first meeting? Think of a number between one and 10, what is it? <laughs> Close enough. Is that what these up to for? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so thanks for uh, your time. Again, thanks to the Wallet Association for having me speak today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, I already gave him out. He's looking for a ride. No ride giveaways. All right, thank you, Eric. Here's, uh, here's a little prize pack from uh, the OCWA. All right.